everybody, and welcome to tonight's event for the Cambridge Science Festival. I'm Julian Puppet, and I run the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College. We're a new centre in a very old institution, aimed at getting people to think and talk about all sorts of things that are interesting and worthwhile, and it's great to work uh, with the Science Festival on these. Uh, we have a lot of events coming up. We're talking next week about quantum computing. We're talking about climate change and the Anthropocene era. And we have lots more coming up throughout the year. Now, yesterday we had an amazing event here about whether tech makes us miserable. If you missed it, there's a live stream available on the Jesus College YouTube. But don't watch it now, because now we're going to learn about how tech can actually be a lot more fun than that. It doesn't just have to be... Uh, a miserable experience. And we have somebody who is definitely not miserable, uh, and it's great to have Tim Wilkinson here with us. Tim is an amazing man. He's an amazing electrical engineer. Uh, he is a fellow here at Jesus College. He has also offered to demonstrate a hucker for us uh, on demand. Um, <laughs> but I can't quite tell if he was joking about that. Perhaps we'll find that out uh, when we come on to questions. But Tim is an amazing man with a hologram. Tim, over to you. Thanks for being here. Brilliant. <laughs> Great. Could we dim the lights just a tad? Whoever the light dude is. Like a bit of ambiance. <laughs> dim. Down. Please. I like to hide in the dark. Anyway, if you take any, fo any flash photography, please, only from the waist up. So this is me. I'm based here in West Cambridge, electrical engineering, also a fellow of this college. And uh, I've been working on holography for longer than I can actually remember. And uh, for a long time, it's been a, a dream, an idea, a concept, a fun thing. But recently, it's become actually a commercial reality. And we have Vivid Q over there, who are um, the latest round of commercialization of this technology. And uh, hopefully, you'll get a chance to have a look at their demonstration. And hopefully, I'll give you a chance today to describe what's good about holography, what's new, what's old. And hopefully, you might learn a little bit of science in the background as well. Who knows? I'll give them my best. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold, so I apologise now. So ubiquitous uh, introduction. I'm going to describe what a hologram is and who Huygens was, or Huygens, I've discovered his name was, recently. What can we use them for? Start a company, why not? There's always a good chance of that, and then try and look at commercial routes for these things. And then finally, I want to talk about the future, which I'm calling the holodeck, hence the name of the title, which was originally about Star Wars, because a lot of my holographic expertise came from Star Wars originally. But actually, it's now ended up in Star Trek, because Star Trek has the holodeck. And the holodeck is, I think, one of the areas where holograms have a great future. And I'll talk about that at the very end, hopefully, which relates to what Vivid Q are doing as well. That's, by the way, a holographic Christmas tree. So why Star Wars? Well, this particular scene here has plagued me for years. Oh, oh God. Here we go. I'm going to forget the pointer. That's Obi-Wan Kenobi in the background there. That's Princess Leia in the front. Off the screen is uh, R2-D2. And it's from Star Wars, classic moment. Everyone thinks it's a defining moment of hologram. Completely non-holographic. It's not even CGI, it's not even computer graphics. It's HGI, it's hand graphics. It's coloured in by hand. These are later Star Wars movies, also fake scenes. Nothing holographic about them at all. And this is one of the problems with holograms. It's become a, a term which means anything that's whizzy, anything that's fun or looks interesting. Oh, it's a hologram. Incorrect. And here's a good example, which I've got here. I've got it mounted on a stick because it hurt me earlier. <laughs> so, uh, these on the stickers, because when it gets going, if I can get it going, please work. Here we go. Hopefully, you will see pretty pictures. I can't see what it's displaying. Oh, there we go. On the screen. I'll move it around. I know what these things are. They're random Chinese objects, because it's a random Chinese eBay purchase. <laughs> but it is not a hologram. It's sold as a holographic projector, but there is nothing holographic about this at all. It's a pretty display. It's a very dangerous display because it rotates at quite some speed. And if it hits you, trust me, it hurts. It hurts a lot. But it is nothing more than a clever illusion. It's a rotating bar of LEDs, which gives you a nice image. And one of the reasons why the image looks three-dimensional is because you can't see the bar because it's rotating so fast. All you see is the light from the bar in your eye. And that gives you the illusion of a pretty picture, or a, what they now call a hologram. The hologram it is not. Let's turn that off and make sure it doesn't come back to life. It also makes a nice fan. 
But it's quite, quite hefty, so uh, be careful if you do buy one. They are seriously painful if they whack you in the arm. I can tell you now. So that's not a hologram. This is also not a hologram. This is a piece of plastic stuck to your mobile phone. Similar illusion, once again. You can see the image of the jellyfish. I can't get this laser pointer thing to figure out. There we go. On the screen. And this is uh, effectively a reflection off that screen. And it looks like it's floating in space. And this bigger brother is this, the Museon eyeliner which is made for gorillas playing live on a proper stage. This is full size. And you can see there's quite a lot of infrastructure in the background. There's quite a lot of um, bits and pieces around here, screens, etc. This is also not a hologram. It's called a holographic display, but there is nothing holographic about that at all. In fact, this is a 19th century parlor trick, something called Pepper's Ghost, which is essentially a very important concept to this talk, even though it's not holographic in any way. The key here is you can't see the projector. The projector is down here, this bloke here, onto a white screen here, and then there's an invisible screen here, which is basically something like fishnet tights or cling film, and the light reflects off the screen onto the fishnet tights, and all you see is the image, or the outline of the image, so you see the gorillas here, and you can see the bits of infrastructure with the screens hanging off them, but because they're on a black background, you see a very, very bright image, same with my rotating LED bar, and so all of a sudden your brain thinks, oh, this must be real, this must be 3D, because it can't see the edges, and that's a key concept not seeing the edges. Remember that? It's going to come up several times through the rest of this talk. <clears throat> That's what it looks like when, it's not turned, when the lights are turned on. You can see there the big cling film screen, projector at the top, white screen at the bottom, and all you see is the artifact reflected off that transparent screen. So the key is you can't see the screen. You can't see the edges, so your brain starts to accept things as being very realistic. So, what is a hologram? This is a difficult question. First of all, Google. Google knows everything, as we know, and actually Google's not bad. This is what Google says. This is actually from a dictionary, which is obviously a good sign. A three-dimensional image formed by the interference of light beams from a laser or other coherent light source. That actually is pretty spot on. That is what a hologram is, which is good because it's the definition of the word hologram, which I'd hope in a dictionary would be correct. You go to other fonts of all knowledge, Wikipedia, another reliable source, I used to think so, and you get this. Holography is the science and practice of making holograms. <laughs> and then even more annoyingly, this is what I used to use when I started this talk a few years ago, somebody, because this, you know, this is open source, you can add things to it, somebody has added above this another line, and I want to find who it is and go out and shoot them, which is a hologram is an image that appears to be three-dimensional and which can be seen with the naked eye. Pants. That is not a hologram. That is the modern concept of a hologram. That is the spinning bar, the museum eyeliner, the funky wrapping paper. None of these are real holograms. They are illusions or uh, um, tricks that trick the eye to give you a particular image. That is not a hologram. Hologram is the way in which the image is generated in the first place. Go a bit further down Wikipedia, and you find holography is a technique for recording and reconstructing wave fronts. That's the classical Gaborian view of holograms. That's actually pretty good as well. But actually, I have my own definition, and I say this. A hologram is anything that controls light using wave properties. If you use the wave-like properties of light, which is often called diffraction in uh, posh terms, then you are essentially creating a hologram. And I've got a good example of that. I've got the, the holy grail of holograms, sorry. I need to liquidize my throat or I'm going to keel over. <coughs> I have here a, a hologram. Hopefully the screen will come on. The screen dude, where you are? Come on, screen dude. There we go. Oh, it's tiny. Look at that. Oh, God. <laughs> can we, we can hopefully we can zoom in in a minute. It's like cack handed for me, which is a bit rubbish. Oh. Come on, zoom. There we go. Oh, there we go. Hopefully, you can see there. Can you see what that is? A little bit blurry because the light sources in this room aren't ideal. And if you want to see it better, you need to look at the ones outside. Ooh, ooh. Out, ooh, ooh. Okay, he's good with his joystick. I don't know if you can see. Come on, there he is. And actually, that's not a very good picture of this cat. If you want to see this cat, look at it under a proper um, light source, like the ones outside, and you'll see what is a very scarily realistic cat. And that's because this is a cat. This is not a picture a cat, what you're looking at is a photographic film which has an interference pattern recorded into it by a rather complicated laser process 
made in the 70s by some very, very talented Russian gentlemen who essentially recorded these um, um, images for posterity into photographic film. So what they do is they shine the light on the cat. The cat light gets recorded in the film. You then shine more light on the film, and it reproduces the light as if the cat was there. There's no pixels, there's no sampling, there's no digital media, there's no JPEG, MPEG, any kind of peg. It's purely the cat. The cat is recorded in time in this piece of film. It's a bit creepy, I know, but it is actually the original cat. Go out there and see the little girl with the piece of wood. Even creepier, trust me. And she had to stand still for six or seven minutes. This cat had to stand still for six or seven minutes to have this hologram taken. You ever tried to get a cat to stand still for six minutes? Good chance the cat may well have been stuffed. <laughs> Whatever the Russian equivalent is. That is what we want to do. That is the holy grail of holograms. That is using the wave light properties to create the light as if the object was really there. Not an illusion, not a mirage, not any kind of smoke and mirrors. Purely the actual light as if the object was in front of you. That's what a hologram can do if you get it right. The problem is it requires a complicated photographic process. It requires 70s technology we don't have anymore. And it's rather difficult to uh, control and get accurate and get high quality. It's a real skill making those kind of photographic holograms. So what I want to talk to you today is what we can do in between those two extremes. The, the WYSI light shows from eBay or the ph photographic film holograms. In between, there's a really nice area where our research works, what we can do with the diffraction and wave-like properties. So what are these waves I talk of? Or, most importantly, what is light? Now, we could be here all day doing this, and I wouldn't understand it as much as you do. So I'm going to give you a very quick, very simple view of what I need to know about light. Light is a very complicated subject, but there's a couple of very useful things you can take out of it, and that's enough to understand how holograms work fundamentally. So I always start with a bit of history. Who's this? Sir Isaac, the great Sir Isaac. He wrote a book, which, although it's spelt slightly oddly, is Optics, which is essentially his treatise of light, how he thought light worked. And he did a very famous experiment where essentially he threw light through a prism and he saw the breakup of colors um, from that prism. Amazingly, this is, this, is, this is how good 17th century publications were. You could write a book like Optic and not actually explain why the colors were there, because he couldn't. It took another couple hundred years for somebody to explain why the colors were that what they were and the order they were in, etc. But still, he observed the colors and he pu published it in a very complex book. However, fundamentally, it's wrong. It's something that Newton, I know this is really controversial for a Cambridge alumni, Cambridge academic, but Newton did not get everything right. He was close, but he was not quite right. With Newton's theory alone, you cannot explain how the cat is recorded in that film. You cannot explain how holograms work. You've got to go a bit more complicated than that. You've got to go into the nether regions of the 17th century of the other guys who were working around Newton, who Newton was basically debunking. And here's my personal hero, Christian Huygens, or Huygens, as I think he's now pronounced, I discovered this morning. And he is essentially a Dutch scientist who did some really quite astounding things in the 17th century, one of which was to think light. It's a wave, which even today is pretty out there. It's a pretty special thought, but 17th century? Oh, my goodness. How on earth he came up with this idea is just totally bizarre. But he did, and he wrote a paper on it, and he fought with Newton about it, and he lost. As did this man, who is uh, Robert Hooke, and there's this lovely series of paintings by this lady, Rita Greer, who has historically pieced together um, various tales about Hooke over the years. And uh, <coughs> essentially, these are his portraits. Were, um, her it, it, her um, appreciation of his portraits There's about 16 of them, I think, in total. They're really quite interesting. There's lots of hidden nuggets of things hiding in the background, like, for instance, here, um, there is a microscope. If you wrote a very famous book called Micrographia, which is essentially the first time people looked down microscopes at small things. He drew some amazing pictures of fleas and spiders' legs and stuff. And he was also the inventor of many, many other things. But he was also, along with Huygens, a fan of this wave theory, this radical idea that light was actually not what Newton said it was, but was actually a wave. And that's quite a remarkable thing for the 17th century, where science was very much at a huge um, turning point, huge crossroads of great ideas, lots of things came out in the 17th century, gravity, calculus, amazing things, and wave theory was one of the things that took a little while longer to actually percolate to the top. So what did Newton tell us? Well, Newton gave us corpuscular propagation. Sounds posh? Isn't. 
tells us that light travels as a series of particles. Light is some kind of little mysterious particle which shoots through space and time and lands splat on a target and you see it as colour, whatever. <coughs> so there's one particle. There's another one, another one, another one. So his theory was that basically I could talk about the direction of light as a series of little particles travelling in a straight line. And this gives us what we call rays. And actually, you can do a lot with rays. You can design your glasses. You can design the lens of the projector, although this is a LED screen. You can design lots of other clever optics with ray tracing, etc. It's actually quite a powerful te technique. However, it doesn't make holograms work. Rays are not sufficiently good enough to make holograms a function of, his, of this idea. And the reason why is because as I propagate along, I've got no point of reference. I've got these particles. They're traveling along like ping pong balls being fired out of a gun. But yet, I don't know where I am. I don't know how to trace my motion. I've got no way of recording any kind of reference other than the direction they're going in. All I know is that they're going that way and they're going real fast. That's all I know. So it's not good enough. Huygens and Hooke came up with this idea of wave propagation. Ripples on a pond. I mean, for goodness sakes, that is a totally bizarre concept of way to describe light. I, to this day, don't understand how they came up with this idea. Not something that's obvious at all, but that's a very powerful idea when you think about it. So you have the central source that came with this idea of a Huygens or Huygens wavelet, which is essentially a central point of emission. And then light ripples out in ever-increasing ever -decreasing circles away from that central point. And as it gets further away, the intensity of the waves decrease. And so it fades off into infinity. But more importantly, if I follow a direction of travel, what have I got? Well, I've got now a series of ripples, a series of peaks and troughs, which start at the middle point and follow that arrow out in direction. So actually, I've now got this reference point which allows me to track where I am on that propagation as I go through. So how do I decide who's right? Well, we have a little test, and that is essentially a quite simple wave test. Shine light through a small slit. Take a tiny hole, like Newton observed with his uh, um, colours through, and look at what happens as light shines through that hole onto a screen. So there's a tiny hole, there's a slit there, what happens if I illuminate that and I use either corpuscular or wave theory to predict what happens? Newton says essentially corpuscular travel, so the corpuscles will essentially travel through that hole. So the ones that hit the black bits will get bounced back like ping pong balls. The ones that travel through will go through the hole and keep going straight line like rays. So if that was true, what would happen? My rays would pass through, I'd keep going, and eventually if I put some kind of screen so the rays or the corpuscles hit that screen, then I'll get essentially an image of that slit. I'll get a shape which represents where the ping pong balls pass through the slit, and everywhere else I'll get black. That's what corpuscular properties do. <laughs> propagation of light. However, that's not what actually happens. Let's look at Huygens. Huygens says that light is a wave. There's my slit. Now I illuminate it with my waves. So what happens? Well, when the waves hit the slit, the ones that don't pass through get lost or get bounced back. But there's a small number which essentially pass through that little hole. And what Huygens tells us is that I can represent any wave as a sum of little ripples like this added together. So if I want to represent that little piece there, I break it up into tiny little chunks. I treat them like individual little radiating sources, and I add them up as they propagate beyond that slit. And if you do that, something weird happens. This is what happens. Light does not travel in straight lines. Light can go around corners, because basically, as the light passes through the gap, the little ripples essentially expand out until you start to get these strange little edges coming out of that propagation. So I don't now get a shadow of the slit, I now get a much more complex pattern, and you can see hopefully it's brighter in the middle, and it's a bit dim there, and there's a brighter bit there, and a bit dim, and then a brighter bit there as you go through. I'm getting this series of what we call fringes, which come from that shape and structure of that slit. So if I put a screen, I get something that looks now like that. I don't just get a big bright bit in the middle where the slit was, I also get these repeating side lobes or repeating um, reflections, not reflections, uh, copies of that original structure. And that's because of the wave-like properties. It's because of interference. As waves combine together, they will interfere with each other and create a much more complex pattern than we see here in this uh, image. <coughs> in fact, 
basically, they're both right to a certain extent because there are some aspects of light which you have to have corpuscular theory for. Um, things like uh, momentum theory, etc., needs to have some kind of idea of corpuscles or mass or photonic um, properties. But fundamentally, for us to understand how holograms work, all I need to know is that light has that wave like property. In fact, there are a few other people involved. You want to know who these guys are? This guy, obvious. Yeah, this guy. Wow, oh, good man. That's good. That's really good. Man, put a cat in the box. Yep. This guy, all-time hero. No. Maxwell. Maxwell, man with the beard. Yep, Maxwell. Those three guys basically tied up the mess in between and came up with some serious stuff, which actually explains it. This is the only math in the whole talk you're pleased to know. The Schrodinger's equation, which gives us wave light propagation. And we have Maxwell's equation, which gives us electromagnetic for light. And the combination of those, and a bit of relativity thrown in for good luck, means that we can essentially explain most, not all, of what happens in the optical systems. In fact, I think Uli's talk in a week's time on quantum will describe some of the things you can't predict with just those equations, because there are some quantum aspects which even um, confuse us today with the whole predictability of light. So light is quite a complicated thing to describe in a very short time. Um, so uh, I'm not going to say too much more about the complexity of the process. However, Huygens gives us waves, waves give us diffraction, and diffraction gives us holograms. That's the take home message. It's the wave like property of light that allows us to control light using this holographic approach. So there's my ripple in the pond, there's my wave radiating in the center. As I said before, what really matters is if I follow a line from the center here, oh god, this thing's on the this, out on it, follow a line from the middle to the edge, what I find is a series of repeating periodic peaks and troughs, which is, which is essentially the property of the wave as it propagates out um, from the center. More importantly, as I know where I started in the middle, I can find anywhere along that line where I am as I propagate along, which is what I can't do with my ray theory alone. All rays give me this direction, whereas waves give me this ability to follow the trajectory and actually find out what's going on. So it's those peaks and troughs that are key to understanding the principles of holograms. A bit more history, a few more people, Fresnel or Fresnel as most people call them, Fraunhofer and Fourier, basically a whole bunch of maths which explained a whole bunch of uh, things and of course some of the audience might know this is my sheet, uh, sheet. this is Fraunhofer, Fourier and uh, Fresnel, no, <laughs> we did have a goat, he was called Huygens, unfortunately he's no longer with us. Um, but uh, yeah, they're Max Mountain rare breed uh, sheep. And uh, if you look on the website, there's an article from about a year ago where the senior's wife, Liz, essentially took the, the wool from these sheep and created some very nice yarn from them. And there's also the name of some very important 17th and 18th century scientists who uh, essentially created the, the backdrop to my next big player in the, in the saga, which is the guy that actually proved that Huygens and Hook were correct. The last piece of the puzzle comes from this guy. And there he is. <laughs> yeah, it's him. <laughs> and he did a very famous experiment, not just Young's modulus for uh, stress and strain of materials, not just the polychromatic colour of the rainbow, all these different things that he's very famous for, a very, very important man in, uh, in many different areas of physics. But he did this very famous experiment, which most people will do at some point in their physics career at school, which is called Young's Slips Experiment. And it's the same as my test of Hooke versus, um, sorry, Newton versus Huygens, but he has two slits rather than one. So he gets a more interesting predictable pattern, which is this diffraction pattern here, which comes from the interference of the waves as they pass through the uh, slits. And the little cartoon on the, right, on, the, on the left here, I'll come back to that in a moment, but that's the key to why we get bright and dark fringes as a result of the wave-like properties. Remember, the waves are from the ripples, and it's the combination of the position of the waves with respect to each other that create those bright and dark um, fringes. I should point out as well, this is the man that invented the photographic technique that we see today. Let's see, Leith Lupinet also, I uh, should be technically correct here, also discovered holograms and exactly who did where, when, what. I don't want to get into the whole nasty debate of it, but basically, Gabor is the one that was effectively um, got the most credit for it. And that's actually a hologram of Gabor. That's how cool he was. He was capable of sitting for his own personal hologram. But also, it doesn't have to be waves in light, it can be waves in fluids. This is an aerial photograph of a beach. We have here, you can see at the top here, a series of waves coming in into what are a pair of groins, where there's a gap. 
And what you see here is the beginning here of an interference pattern which is exactly the same as that interference pattern there. So it works any wave, it's the same principle, but it works with fluids, it works with sound, it's a kind of hollow sound with a holographic sound control using very clever speaker designs to control the wave properties of sound. And you can also use interference in that respect as well. Anywhere there's a wave, you can do this technique. And it works very well with light. So, it's all about these waves. So there's my ripple, now this one dimensional view. What's important about it? Well, it's how I combine them together. If I have two slits, like a young slits experiment, I have lots of different paths. If you look at back at this picture here, there are lots of different ways that light can propagate from the slit here, oh uh, god my goodness, my mouse all, to the screen here. And basically the, the light will take different paths, and those paths have different lengths. If I look at the way they combine, I get two things that occur. I get essentially the areas where the peaks and troughs are overlapping each other. So here I have peak, peak, trough, trough. If I add those two waves together, what do I get? I get a bigger wave. And that's called constructive interference. I'm making the light brighter at that point in the system. But more importantly, if I have what's called antiphase, where rather than peak, peak, trough, trough, I have peak, trough, trough, peak. So here I have, you can see here, the combination of a trough and a peak. They effectively cancel each other out. They're on opposite sides to each other. And so I get what's called destructive interference, or nothing. So those black and white stripes that you see in interference patterns is just a combination of destructive and constructive interference. And that's all a hologram is. All a hologram is, is using this to put light in some places, and this to put no light in other places. So when you see a holographic picture of the cat, the light that is where the cat is, is interfering in your eye to show you the picture of the cat. And the areas where there's no information, dark in the background, etc., or dark parts of the cat, that's where destructive interference is occurring, and you're getting no light falling on your retina. And it's the same if I do this kind of thing here. So I have here some holograms, which I etched into a piece of plastic. And here a laser pointer. Hopefully you'll see. Those people behind me, sorry, I'm not big. See images. My laser pointer starts off like that, but I'm passing it through as a series of little apertures, or little slits. They're combining together and they're forming pretty advertisements for the diffractor optical vision, or eyes, or strange ladies, or keyboards, or random text in different languages. All these different images, ooh, look at that, pretty. Oh, cool. All these things are formed by the process of interference. So where the eye is dark, I'm getting destructive interference. And where the eye is bright, I'm getting constructive interference. Sorry. This is taking photographs. Quick, quick, quick. Getting tired. Yeah. And that's all the hologram is. It's just controlling the interference process um, <clears throat> in a clever way. So the only difference between young slits and the cat is number of slits. Young slits, two. Cat, me. That's the big difference. <laughs> <clears throat> and the reason why this works is what we call phase. This ability to delay one wave with respect to another so we get either constructive or destructive interference. We call that the phase of, of the, the waves. And that's what we get from Huygens. That's what Huygens gives us, which we don't get from Newton in this process. <clears throat> so basically, a hologram is lots and lots and lots and lots of slits. And lots and lots and lots of diffraction. So for instance, young, two, light touch, I'll show you later on the table here, about four million. Cat hologram, I reckon approximately, is it 9,000 trillion of that order? I can't remember this. Is. <laughs> 9 trillion, sorry, not 9,000. <clears throat> so you can see the reason why I get such a good image from the cat is because it's a heck of a lot more control. I've got more um, slits, I'm getting more interference, giving me a much better high resolution image, as opposed to young, where I only have two slits, so I just get little black and white stripes. But the principle is exactly the same. It's interference, constructive, destructive interference that creates the images that we see in the system. <clears throat> so basically, we effectively scale this up. So for instance, if I have to go from two slits to a, something like that, a checkerboard structure, I can essentially calculate the diffraction pattern which looks like this, and I can show you this one as well. This one on this. This screen is away. So there's my laser pointer. And there's the diffraction pattern, if I go far enough away. Why well, do you do the same now? I think we're big enough. 
Well, that's effectively light from the laser passing through a checkerboard pattern on a screen, and that's diffracting to form that image. It's a very simple process which I make more complex by having ever more slits in my system. So a hole or a young slit, I'm going to refer to from now on as a pixel. But this is confusing because images have pixels, and also holograms have effectively apertures or pixels, and yet I can use a pixel to diffract to form a pixel in an image, so it's going to get a bit confusing. But I'm going to refer to pixels in my hologram as being the apertures which, use, which I use to control the diffraction process in the system. <coughs> so basically, I have a couple of tests here. Can you see in the world of holograms? This is not quite too easy to have read the answer on the screen. What is the diffraction pattern of that? That's a hologram. There might be some clues in the circular shape, maybe. Would it be nice if holographic diffraction processes, because ripples on ponds tend to radiate from the centre, there's a good chance that maybe a circular structure will also create a circular image, and it does. It's actually the hologram of a circular dot. This one? You can squint as much as you like, it doesn't help. <laughs> you can't see a hologram world unless you're really special. You might think it's a square. Unfortunately, holograms are not that kind. It's a diamond. <laughs> The last one, you might think that's a diamond, <laughs> but guess what, it's not even a square, notice, we've actually seen the square already in our um, earlier Hooke versus, uh, sorry, Newton versus Huygens experiment, this is actually a cross. So unfortunately it's not a simple science predicting what the hologram is to generate a particular image by this process. Some very simple aspects are quite easy to see, others are really quite difficult. So it comes down to computers and computational algorithms which actually allow us to compute these things in reality. <coughs> so in fact, what we end up with is something like that, that's the hologram, that's actually a pattern that's been generated to create a particular function, and that function which we often call the replay field or the image it generates, in this case is a rather uninteresting array of 16 dots. What's important is it's mathematically actually quite simple, the relationship between the two is the Fourier transform, I've also got that, this hologram, here as well. Hopefully. Be nice to point out. Well, hey, you got that? And there's my array of 60 knots. So this pattern here is actually on this piece of glass here. I'm shining my laser pointer through it, and I'm getting that array of 16 dots um, being formed by that diffraction process. The interference of the waves is giving me exactly the image. And I calculate this via a fairly complicated computer algorithm, which uh, I'm not going to go into. You'll be pleased to know. So we normally want this, what the hologram generates, it's what you see, which now erroneously by Wikipedia is what we call the hologram in the real world, but in fact what we actually want is this pattern which allows me to diffract light to form this image. So this is the hologram, this is the CAT photographic film um, system, and this is the CAT picture that you see from the process. And we calculate this via this Fourier transform, a vast some complicated algorithm with fancy names, simulated annealing genetic algorithm, Gertzberg, Saxton, you name it, we use it to calculate them, and Vivid Q actually have a whole library of different functions they use to calculate their holograms, because basically they want to generate an image on their head-up display, which looks like this, and they need to calculate this as fast as possible, um, so they can run gaming, etc., in real time. And that's quite a complicated process, going around this loop to generate the holograms we want to calculate. So, I'm going to skip this bit pretty quickly because we haven't got time to go into all the technology behind holograms. But one of the problems I have so far is everything I've shown you is fixed. It's a chrome mask, it's a, it's a photographic film, it's a stamped, embossed hologram. They're all physical pieces of plastic or glass. So I want to change them, I'm going to physically find another one, faff around. In reality, I want to be able to create reconfigurable holograms. I want to create holograms where I can change in real time. For that, I need a technology which allows me basically to display slits or apertures and then change the ability to turn them on and off. And there's lots of technologies out there, most of you actually are sitting with them in your pocket. Who has a mobile phone? Oh, far more people that actually put their hands up. <laughs> Unless you've got a Galaxy S9 or 10 or 8, you're almost certain to have a phone that has a little crystal display in it. And that little crystal display is actually an array of apertures which you can turn on and off. Each pixel in the image is basically a slit, which I could use for the Young Slits experiment, and create complex holographic structures. 
So liquid crystal displays are effectively a way of making reconfigurable holograms. So laptop displays, phone displays, that technology I can actually harness to create a reconfigurable hologram. I'm not going to go into the complex set of processes and materials and quite a difficult thing to explain quickly and uh, succinctly. You're just going to have to take it for granted that liquid crystal displays allow me to create a reconfigurable hologram. Then we can move on and do something useful with them. There's a couple of problems. One is that there's actually an inverse relationship between the size of the pixel in the hologram and the size of the image it generates. So the smaller the pixel, the bigger the image. Which means basically, these kind of things, the pixels are too big. So actually what we want is another form of liquid crystal that you probably haven't come across in your pocket, and that are these things. They're called spatial light modulators, and they're basically a miniature version of the liquid crystal display. Here you can see someone's finger, and this is a camera viewfinder that's been flicked out of the camera, and this is a little tiny image which I can use to display my hologram and then use it to create a holographic system. And in fact, the projector up here has three of them, red, green, and blue, and it will be used with a light source to project images onto the, the screen. I can basically take those devices out of that projector and create reconfigurable holograms using that same liquid crystal technology. So it's just a way of creating arrays of apertures that I can turn on and off. <coughs> so let's make a holographic display. This is what I need. It's quite a simple process. I have basically my liquid crystal display over here which is essentially displaying my hologram. So that has an image on it, which we've already seen before. Everything else is natural. There's no lenses, there's no funky optics required. It's just waves. They just diffract, and away they go, but eventually they form an image, which in this case is a beach ball on the screen. So holographic projectors, holographic systems, are very, very simple um, uh, things to build and create. But in fact, it's a very simple process of allowing light in its natural form to interfere to form these complex structures. And although I'm not going to prove it, the bit that Fresnel brought to the equation party is I can form images anywhere within this space, and that's what VirtuQ have got in their um, VR system, the ability to change the focus of the, of the image, because you can see the hologram can be focused anywhere in this space. We are going to concentrate on the screen for now, but it's a three-dimensional world after all. Now, here's a good lesson. You do research in the lab, you have lots of clever students, and then somebody comes along who says, everything you're doing is not quite right. And we're trying to make holographic projectors, and we're getting images like this. Not nice. Fuzzy, blurry, blobby, messy, nasty images. And we've been using algorithms that we've been developing for years and years and years, honing them like well-professional engineers. Every single piece of love and care have gone into these algorithms, and we didn't want anyone to tell us they were wrong. And that's what my guys did, bless them. They actually came up with a, a concept which said many of these algorithms that are generating these images are not as good as you think they are, Wilkinson. Maybe you should rethink your strategy. And they actually did some very simple perception tests. And here's an example of two images. One on the left and one on the right are both created by holograms. Neither of them are very good, I admit. I admit. However, one of them is better than the other. And I'm hoping, <coughs> if you look at those two images, you're going to say to me, that one, is a better image than that one. Yeah, yeah. There's always someone in the audience who disagrees because they're awkward. But most people, certainly about 90% of the people that did this test, said that one was a better image. You've got a bit more information in it, it's a bit clearer. Mathematically, that is the better image. So when I calculate my algorithms, which I've been doing for umpteen unforgettable years, I get that image. When they did their algorithms, they got this one. And it turns out this one is the one that looks much nicer. So I had to eat humble pie and realise that actually all the years I've been generating algorithms, I've been doing it wrong. And the reason why is because when I want to generate this information, I try and make it as bright as possible. And actually that's not what you want. If you look at an image, you not only see the image, but you also see the background. And it's actually the noise in the background that's critical in how these images look. And so they came up with an algorithm that allows you to control the noise. And by doing so, they have massively improved overnight, literally overnight, the quality of the holograms we went from this kind of thing to this kind of thing. All of a sudden we had very clear images. We had Brittany and Grayscale for goodness sakes. <laughs> um, we had really quite an amazing series of images. And I had to literally say, okay, fair enough, fair pot, I was wrong. My 10 years of algorithms are rubbish. And in fact, 
You want to be controlling the noise in a clever way. And so OSPR was born and uh, better quality images. And this was kind of a turning point between lab-based fun and games and the reality of holograms and the holographic projectors possibly making it into the real world. Because basically, Holly was into your students. Very important, they're actually quite clever and uh, often thought some very good ideas. And you're not always right no matter how good you are in the academic world. They then started a company it's called Light Blue Optics, and basically they miniaturized the projector using the fact that there was no clever optics required for diffraction. They used an off shut liquid crystal device to display the holograms, and they came up with this thing here, this tiny little projector, which is their first demonstrating. You see it's about the size of a credit card, and that projects a full one color image over here using a green laser. Um, and that got them money and funding and allowed them to create a more complex system, which is this one on the table, which is called the Light Touch. And it's essentially a holographic projector. I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up or not, but I'll turn them on. <coughs> I'm lucky to have two of them. So let's see if they can pick them up. Will the camera do do thing? Maybe not. Camera man away. Ah, excellent. That'll do, that's fine. Uh, you can see. Oops. Let's head for this one. Oops, no, not too far. So this is a holographic projection onto a onto a piece of paper, and it's using three lasers, green, 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 and blue, it's using a crystal display as before. You draw the holograms, and what you're seeing here is the image being diffracted onto a piece of paper. And uh, the other one you just about to see in the corner here, which has colour images. You can see the colour, high quality images. And if you want to have a look at the end of the talk, I'll be sitting there. You can have a look at them, play with them, etc. Um, this is a good example of a holographic projector. Problem is, they didn't sell many. They didn't sell many for many reasons. One of which was that tablets came out at the same time. Miniature LED projectors came out at the same time. The market space got very crowded. Smartphones became very clever with their screen designs, etc. So basically, it was a product that didn't really have a place to live. And so eventually, they went on to do other things. Um, however, the touch interface that they put into this system um, is really quite clever, and it's a touch interface that still keeps them going as a company um, today. So uh, I can say more about that at the end if they want. I can say more about what they happened to their holographic system um, <clears throat> in terms of its projection. However, I want to finish with a little bit about the future. Because we've done two-dimensional holographic projectors. What about 3D? Well, 3D is not that difficult, actually. It's a, it's a hologram. It's one single hologram, but it has three different depth planes. So it has a depth plane that's 6 centimeters, 12 centimeters, and 22 centimeters, and it focuses the letters A, B, and C on those planes. It's one hologram with one laser, but it now focuses the images at different depths in three dimensions. And that I can do with the Fresnel part of the holograms, as opposed to the Fourier and Fraunhofer parts of the hologram. It gives me the ability to put Z dimension into my holographic diffraction process. And here's an example of a very simple experiment. This is just a little crystal display. As you can see in the background here, this thing here is a display. There's a red laser pointer literally down here below the screen. And as you can see here, a couple of three-dimensional bucky balls being floating in space. And it's filled around with a camera. You can take a picture of it um, quite clearly. And the problem with this projector is it only has a very narrow viewing angle. I can only see those bucky balls over about a nine degree angle. It means you've got to be in the right place at the right time to see that image. So it's a very simple experiment. It shows that I can do 3D quite reliably, but it also shows up the limitations of my technology. And this comes back to the crystal displays we're using in the lab. They're not actually small enough pixels to make a large enough image in a 3D system. And it's one of the problems we still have yet to solve properly. I'm looking forward into uh, holographic display technology in the future. However, kinetic did a full colour version of that same concept, bigger lasers, more complicated devices, and they did effectively a full three-dimensional CAD system that allowed you to build and manipulate a car. And that car looks a lot better than it does in this picture. It's a very high quality rendition of that uh, structure, which has been generated via the same holographic projection, but this time the projector is actually in the background here, where that green aperture is there. And what you see bouncing off this mirror table in front of you is this floating car. Princess Leia style in 3D. And that was about 15 years ago, so it's not new. Um, very, very expensive, very, very complicated, and uh, right at the very limits, but we can do with the technology. So 
was too difficult to make this a commercial reality um, in the system. So, what's big now? Well, what's big now is R, reality. Insert first word here, virtual, augmented, mixed, you name it. I've just called it XR, because those of you who remember the, when ADSL came out in uh, telephone lines, there were all these different formats, ADSL, VDSL, HDSL, and eventually those went to XDSL, because there were so many different versions of it, they just put a little sort of X, I mean, any type of DSL you like. Well, this is the same thing, any kind of reality you like in the system. Any kind of system where you effectively bump the display onto your head and then project into your eyes. And people have been doing this for a while. This is not a new technology. It first came out in the 80s and the 90s. Failed to die to death because the technology wasn't quite good enough. And now it's very hot with Oculus Rift and Vive and PlayStation and other sort of products coming out. Um, however, they have one really fundamental problem. And that is, all the products that are out there at the moment assume you have two eyes, Therefore, you take a left view and a right view. Therefore, you must, if I provide a left view of an object and a right view of an object, think it's 3D. But if you see these displays, you try them, it's very realistic. It's very good. However, your brain is a bit more complicated than that, and your eyes are way more complicated than that, because they basically assume that your eye is a camera. And the fact your eye is not a camera, your eye moves, it changes its focus, it's, it's scanning continuously, it's being recorded in the retina, and it's been recorded in the brain. So it's really quite a complicated thing, and it is not a camera. So therefore, this is something that you just bolt a mobile phone display onto your forehead with a nice little package, and you'll all be happy with 3D, is not, unfortunately, the reality. It is X reality, as in where X is a, a variable we can't solve. And eventually you get sick, you feel queasy, you get headaches, and it's the fact that pilots that use VR systems can't fly after a certain amount of time because their visual system has been messed up by the fact that you have a fixed accommodation, a fixed focus plane in the system. However, there is an answer. The hologram, as proven by the cat, can actually give you any depth of focus you like. I can create a full three-dimensional image as if the object was really there. So the technology is available to us to do this kind of thing using our pixelated devices, our diffraction, and our holographic approach. Now what I'm doing is I'm projecting into the eye the information that I want to be seen in my X-reality system. And here's an example, this is Alex. This is Vivid Q, one of the early videos. What you're seeing here is a mixed reality display. The elephant has been generated by the holographic display system, and then everything else is reality. Spot all the different plants in the background, including Goodman's Free Optics book. Um, <laughs> lots and lots of uh, uh, suspicious things out of me as well. Um, <clears throat> but actually, there's something that I want to point out in this video that's far more important. It's very pretty, it's mimicking what your eyes see. So the camera is changing the focus. So you see the front elephant, no change in the hologram, now you see the back elephant. They're both in the same hologram, they're just a different focal plane. That's what VR can't do at the moment. You can't change that focal plane. All you've got is one fixed focus and one fixed view of the world, whereas this gives you multiple depth focus because it's a holographic approach rather than a fixed image. But actually, what's missing from this picture? You can see Alex. You can see elephants. What can't you see? You can't see the protector. And this goes back to what I said at the very beginning. This goes back to the spinny LEDs. The reason why this works so well is because you've taken out the frame of reference of the holographic projector, and that's done by having a near-to-eye system, like a virtual reality system. If you take away the reference of the projector, you just look at the light it produces, and well, hey, it looks really realistic, it looks really excellent um, imagery production. And that's the key to holographic systems. It's not just about creating special images, it's not just about creating clever illusions, it's about also using the visual system of the eye and the brain to actually produce the information that you wanted to see. Then it looks real, then it looks believable, and then it becomes quite a viable product in the system. And that's the key. It's not just the clever diffraction and the holography, it's also the fact that the holographic projector, which is actually out of focus in this image because it's being, you know, your camera's being focused through it, is actually not in your frame, frame of view. And that's really important. Um, by the way, other colleges are available other than some, right? Just point out. And this is their latest demonstration. This is what I've got over in the corner here. 
This is their uh, head display. This is not Alex. I won't say which one can do. And here he's putting it on his display. You can see now the holographic information that's being clicked into your eye. And this is actually what you're seeing on, the, on your retina. This is the game called Skyrim, which I've never played, but apparently it's quite good. And it has multiple depth planes, not just fixed in one plane of depth. It's actually got multiple planes of depth. So your eye can look forwards and backwards into the plane and see different information in the other focus. And that's really important for not throwing up, for not feeling queasy, for not having all the side effects you get in a holographic system. And that's because they're using the mixed reality or the um, virtual reality approach to project into the eye, and they're using the holograms to correct, um, to create the images on your retina. So it's using all the diffraction approach. These images are being diffracted to form these um, the, the, the structure. However, it's being done um, <coughs> in multiple depth planes in this system. And that's key to how these systems work and uh, are successful. <coughs> so finally, my last slide is this one, which goes back to my original title, changing from Star Wars to Star Trek. This is Star Trek Voyager, the best Star Trek. Sorry, people on the internet. <laughs> there was no other Star Trek was better. And this is the holodeck. And the holodeck is an immersive system of holographic projection. The reason why the holodeck works is because you can't see the projectors. The environment is the projector. So my holy grail for this technology is to recreate the holodeck, where the projectors are everywhere. So in a room like this, you can have holographic projectors buried in the walls, but it's projecting the light as if objects were really there. So I could be holographically here, but you wouldn't see the projectors, therefore you see me as a projection, and it looks realistic. And that's the key the holographic system. It's not just clever maths, clever optics, it's also about clever design and how we can actually take the viewer into a realm where they can see the information they want to see and not the projector that's projecting it. You see these images because they project onto paper, but you also look at the projector itself and that's distracting, that's what stops you from seeing the full three dimensional limit. So the holodeck is kind of my vision for where we want to be uh, in the future with holographic technology. There's one fundamental flaw in this image. Anyone know what the flaw is? Any there are any diehard words of fans here? Other than Aaron? Who's this guy? Doctor, yeah. He's a hologram. So you've got a, yeah, don't go there. You've got a hologram in the hologram. Which is there, you know, it is, yeah. Slightly over there in their X reality. But um, yeah. This is the way you want to make holographic projectors work in the future. And what's going to make this possible? Well, actually, I was really pleased. This picture, which was used in my um, blurb on the internet for this talk, is actually really quite important. Because actually, in your pocket, the phone display you have has a phenomenal number of really small pixels in it. So it's capable of displaying the holographic information in a very vivid way. However, there is one slight flaw, and that is this. In order for you to see your images as normal images, we have colour filters. We have little red, green, and blue filters which essentially filter out the colour combinations to create a colour image on your phone. That mucks up my hologram big time. That prevents the phase, it prevents the waves, and it stops the whole process from working. So if I could find a manufacturer of mobile phones, if there's anyone out here, please, let's talk afterwards, who can make this technology without these blasted filters, which is actually one of the more complicated processes in the phone construction, then that will be a big, big turning point in holographics getting from the lab um, out of um, small companies and into bigger companies and bigger production and bigger products um, accordingly, because that's what's holding us up at the moment. We're limited by the technology that we can display the holograms with in these systems. But it's there. It's just frustratingly not obtainable at the moment because of mass production issues, complicated politics, etc. So I'll finish there. Hopefully I've shown to you a little bit about holograms work. I've talked a little bit about how we use them and how we can create various displays, products with them and this need to hide the projector and create an immersive system in order for them to be successful. And my final line, by the way, we may also need a holographic <coughs> camera. Because the world is not full of holographic content. It's very hard to capture the world as you see it in a holographic form. So we synthesize it, and that's what we're going to do with the Unity gaming and other things, to create synthetic information. But if you want to create real world information, like take a picture of this room and then recreate it holographically, that is still a little bit complicated because we don't have a way of getting that information reliably out of any system. There are various approaches which are being thought of, but we still need a serious holographic camera. Finally, don't forget. <laughs> Say after me, 
A hologram, anything that controls light using this wave model. <laughs> and not what Wikipedia says it is. This is a controversial thought. Thank you. I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tim. That was fascinating and, and certainly threw a lot of light on the subject. Uh, and I'll stand back before I get in more trouble. Um, we do now have time for questions, uh, and we do have some mic runners around. So if you can just wait till the mic gets to you. And I saw the first question was over here. That was very quick. Thank you for the lecture. It was great. However, uh, there's one thing that bothers me. So, uh, so far we have seen all those holograms were projected on some sort of surface from which the light is uh, reflected and goes into our eyes, so we can see it. However, when I think about a hologram, is it is more of a image floating in the space that you can interact with, move those titles or whatever windows. Um, do you think that this is possible? So those objects just floating in the space without the surface to project them on? Absolutely. Uh, ooh, ooh. Um, yeah, definitely. Absolutely no problem at all. Uh, the things that Vivek are doing at the moment are exactly proving that. The elephant video is showing that we are at a very small angle in a very small space, project information. The idea of the holodeck is to scale that up, have more projectors, more information being projected into the real world, and then the frozen Princess Leia hologram becomes a reality. But the key is you've got to take the projector out of the field of view. Otherwise, if I have a holographic projector here, you just stare at the projector. You don't stare at the light that it's projecting from it. And that's the skill, to get the light out of the projector into your eye, but not stare at this, which is the projector itself. But it's not, it's not, a, it's not a technical problem, it's more of a problem of how we actually embed the technology into our, into our world, whether it be a monitor or a screen or a, any kind of environment. So it's, a, it's, it's as much a social factor as it is a technological factor as to how we're going to use this kind of technology in the future to create those floating sort of images. But... You know, the VR approach is one such example where they can holographically project into your eye the image. So you look through the, the system and you see the object as if they were really there in front of you, floating in space. Okay, so we have a question right at the top. Uh, you said uh, that you can uh, get depth uh, perception through putting different diffraction patterns behind each other. Is that correct? That you have... Um, uh, one, one, one diffraction pattern can control depth... So, so with these, wait, well, within certain limits. So, with these elephants, how many diffraction patterns did you have to put behind each other? One, to one hologram that's generating the multi-depth right. information. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, the, the, well, what, what, what Fourier says is I can only control the diffraction in one plane. What Fresnel says is I can create multiple planes where I can control depth simultaneously from the same hologram. Now, there is an information content limit. You can't have an infinite number of depths of like, planes of depths all from one n by n array of apertures. So there is some limit. We don't actually know what that limit is. The idea of what the limits of holograms are in terms of resolution, in terms of what we can resolve from them, is still one of the great unanswered questions of, of research. We've got theories, we've got ideas, but actually what is the fundamental limit is really um, not simple. And that's because it's not a simple information channel. It's a Fourier transform that makes up the whole, the whole process. So it's quite a complicated question. The next question is over here, and then at the back. I'm not sure this is doing anything useful for my psyche. <laughs> hey. um, has any of your research looked at transmissive optics and you know, holographically generating lenses and that sort of thing? Uh, yep, yep. I mean, so uh, I, we, this is only a tip of the iceberg of what we do with holograms. We use holograms in fibres. We use holograms in waveguides. We use holograms all over the place. Anywhere you want to control light, you can use a wave property, a hologram can be inserted to do the job. Um, so, yeah, anywhere there's light in the system, we can use a holographic approach. And there is a company um, in, in Wakefield called Optalysis who make an optical processor rather than a holographic system. It's actually a, an image processing system, but it uses the same mathematics as holograms. And it actually uses diffractive optics holographically to generate the lenses in the system. So the whole thing is programmable. There's no fixed optics in this at all. It's all just little displays, which are either lenses, images, or Fourier transforms in the system. It's all done by diffraction. Um, so you can do anything you like. Uh, it just, you need more devices, and it gets a bit more complicated in terms of the layout. But other than that, Sorry, what was the name? Uh, Optalysis, spelt really badly as well. 
<laughs> um, question right Lots at the back. Wise. I'd like to have a better gender ba balance of questioners, but Ooh. that relies on you as well as me. Uh, you, you mentioned that you have uh, quite a few novel algorithms now for generating these holograms. How would we uh, read about them, please? Um, novel's a strong word, actually. A lot of the algorithms that we use go back to the 60s and 70s. Yeah, talk to Darren. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they all go back to the same principle that the relationship is a Fourier transform or a Fresnel diffraction transform or something similar. It's just how you... Basically, when you have a, a display to displaying the apertures in your, in your system, there's some limit on what it can display. For instance, this device here, the actual display is only binary, so the display only has two states, on and off. When you calculate the hologram, it's fully complex. It's a really... It's complex amplitude and complex phase. And so we have to map that onto a binary modulator. And it's how you do that process in calculating the hologram that's really quite important. That controls noise, controls quality of the image, etc. And that's part of the algorithm approach. And there's lots of different algorithms we can use. Some are sort of classic metropolis simulating linked up algorithms. Some are quite complicated um, algorithms. So um, yeah, but VividQ is what they do. They're, they've focused very much on clever design of algorithms for these things. I mean, the optics is fine, but the the algorithms behind it are really important for getting the data out of the system and onto your actual display, and that's where they've um, found a very strong position. Okay, we have a question over here. Hello. Oh, the thing that mainly caught my attention during your lecture was that's one. Um, SLMs. Well, <laughs> you know, in terms of practical stroke commercial potential, if you will. Yes. Um, I just wondered, is anyone actually using this technology now, and if so, how are they using it? Um, so, by the way, this is what, a, this is what an SLM looks like. It's, that's the sort of size they are, the little shiny rectangles of the display area. So they're quite small. Um, they're used in projectors for this kind of data projector technology. Um, they're used in camera viewfinders. Um, they're used in digital cinema devices. Um, the problem at the moment is that for holographics to really take off, we have to convince the manufacturer of these devices to produce a device that's not quite the same. The device that's in that projector isn't quite right for what I want. I actually want a slightly different variant. In fact, it's a simpler variant to make of the device. Um, but to convince them, I have to have a market and a strategy and a you know, projection. They all use LCD lights. Yeah, they all, all look crystals, yeah. yeah. Look crystals allowed to control very accurately the wave properties of the light. That's what's key. Question over there as well. Mm, hi. Uh, Going back to the first question, just because I don't really know much about um, how light works, etc., but I always get the impression that we perceive light usually when it's on a surface or if it's in space, usually because there's some sort of particle it's reflecting off of. So my question is, if uh, a hologram that is sort of floating, well, possibly floating in space, let's say, how is it that we perceive that? that light if it's not reflecting off something? Um, that depends on how the light is being generated and the quality of the image and the, the frame of reference. If the image is just the information you expect to see, you'll, you'll believe it very quickly. This is a rotating strip of LEDs, but yet you see full colour images because you don't see the rotating strip. It's the same principle with the hologram. I just have to produce that light in the diffractive way into your eye, which is what this system over here does. The problem is, if I have any other frame of reference, then your eye will focus on that, and that's what ruins the illusion. So you have to keep it very pure, and that's quite hard to do because your eye is always looking for information. It's always trying to find new things to look at. And so if you give it any kind of clue as to where the light's coming from, it'll immediately focus on that and the whole thing's gone. So it's keeping it real. So the, you know, going back to the cat hologram, it's keeping that level of quality in the image all the time under all conditions. It's really critical. And that's actually quite hard to do. We don't know how to do that yet. We're only, I mean, that's why we do things like VR, because it gives us a, a platform where we can essentially control the optics very accurately in front of your eyes and therefore not give you much else to look at. But doing it in a real world is actually quite a bit more difficult. You know, the elephant video is done with the camera. To do it with the real eye means you've got to be in the right place at the right time to see it very clearly. And if you move slightly, you, um, you don't see the same effect anymore. So it is, you know, it's an early result on a path towards doing it on a bigger scale. So to get around that, we need to have more projectors, more information, and uh, a much more complex field of view. And that's uh, in the future. And on that note, I think... Oh, sorry, was there one final question right at the top? Just very quick with the mic. 
Okay, so if we're talking about holodecks, there's obviously a tactile component to that. Does it, so does that mean we have to bring like a, a photon with mass into it to get to that level? Uh, that's a really good question, and, and actually that also, I mean, not just you know uh, tactile, but you know opacity. Holograms are really good at making transparent objects. They're really rubbish at making things that you know, light doesn't pass through because that's very difficult for you to give the illusion of. So there's only certain things we can do with holograms in terms of the illusion quality we can generate. Um, to, you know, the tactility side, there are people that make various air blow systems that give you the illusion of touching an object. It takes a little puff of air and controls it very accurately. So you can get that kind of haptic feedback that way. But it is still a very immature area. And it is a big problem of getting to this kind of the, the ultimate reality, which is the hard hologram, which is the Rimmer hologram in Red Dwarf. I well, we don't even quote because it's just so way out there that uh, we can't get to hard light just yet. I'm not sussed hard light. The momentum is an interesting concept, but uh, you don't actually feel light when it hits you, unfortunately. <laughs> no not how much it is until it burns. Tim, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. That was... ideas, wonderful things to play with. Um, for those of you who are watching online, I'm afraid that's it. For those of you who are here, you're very welcome to stay. Have a go with the Vivid Q system. Have a look at any of the amazing holograms here. Or come for a drink in the bar just across the other way. Thanks a lot.